Hi there. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Tinnitus TV. Today, I am talking to Vegas de Milo. You know, plenty of groups come back from hiatus, but Vegas de Milo might be the first to come back from exile. Sort of. Here's the story. Back in the 90s, this San Francisco band released three albums, toured heavily, and took their shot at the brass ring. But like a lot of bands before them, they ended up packing in their rock star dreams for the reality of day jobs and families. Then, also like a lot of bands before them, they reconnected over Zoom during the pandemic. One thing led to another, and now they're back with their first release in 20 years, Black Sheep Lodge. But it's more interesting than your typical comeback album, mainly due to the fact that it's inspired by Liz Fair's landmark debut, Exile in Guyville, which was, in turn, famously inspired by the Rolling Stones' Exile on Main Street. So, yeah, if you're a fan of Fair or the Stones, you'll dig Black Sheep Lodge. But you're also in for a treat if you like The Replacements, Oasis, The Hold Steady, and Wilco, since you'll hear echoes of them all in the band's crunchy, guitar-driven indie rock. With the album out now, magnificently named frontman Foster Calhoun Johnson zoomed in to talk about his love of Liz, building their lodge, herding cats, and plenty more. Enjoy. Hey, Daryl, how are you? Hey, Foster, I am good. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks for making some time for me. Ah, my pleasure. Thanks for uh, making some time for this. Uh, you are in Texas, right? I am. I'm Houston. Ah, how's life there? Uh, you know, it's not so bad. It's, uh, <laughs> summer hasn't started yet. We still Wait have... a it. <laughs> we still got a couple of weeks, uh -huh. uh, you know, where you can go outside in a, a jacket and not instantly start dripping sweat. So, so uh -huh. summer kicks off around March the 1st here. Sure, sure. Well, I've, I've spent enough time at South by to, uh, to know how that goes. Yeah. As, as have you guys, I guess. What, what years did you play there? I think we played there every year between like 98 and 2002. Okay. So I, I, I must have seen you at some point somewhere, I'm sure, because I was there all those years. So, but I don't, I don't recall at all. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, they were, yeah, I, I don't recall a lot either. And I played the shows. Uh, I do remember that the, uh, by the 2002, the last time we played there, we had gotten smart enough to uh, bribe the club sound man to come to our rehearsal the day before and then gave him a little extra. So we may not have been better, but we were certainly louder than all of the other bands. So you may have heard us in 2002. Okay, wherever I was. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, let's let's talk about what we're here to, uh, to, to, to talk about today. Um, you guys are uh, finally, after decades i guess almost uh making a, a fourth have made a fourth and are releasing a fourth album which is called black sheep lodge um and the concept behind it is is pretty cool i don't think i've ever come across uh something that's kind of layered in the way this is layered i could explain it but it's probably better if you do sure well uh one of my brother and I's favorite records from the 90s is uh, Exile and Guideville, which for me is probably one of the best five records of the 90s. And uh, for years, my brother and I had joked about writing a literal like song by song uh, response to, to that record, which famously was supposedly a song by song response to Exile uh, in Guideville. So yeah. um, during the pandemic, uh, when everybody was trapped in their houses and you couldn't go outside for fear of somebody breathing on you, uh, a bunch of the former members of the band started getting together virtually once a week. And then we started trading song ideas. And then we actually started trading songs. So in that period, um, at first, just kind of as, as an experiment, and then later uh, as an organizing principle, I started to literally write uh, a song by song response to Exile and Guide Bell. And that's, um, that's more or less what Black Sheep Lodge is. And uh, yeah, again, I don't, I mean, obviously, you know, there have been answer albums, answer songs. I can't recall that anybody's done an answer album to an answer album. 
kind of opens up infinite possibilities here. The matrix, uh, you know, just bursts open there. Um, so what, what is it about Guyville that makes it for you one of the, the five best albums of that decade? I would say it's the fact that I'm still listening to it decades later. You know, the, the song still really moved me. Um, uh, it's a really, really unique record. Uh, it has a really unique sound. Uh, you know, she wrote it at a period where I think she had only been writing songs for a few years. And so there's, um, she, she, it's written by a songwriter who doesn't know a lot of songwriting rules, which is why it's so original. Yeah. Uh, and I, I guess I've just, I've just lived with the songs uh, for, for years and years, particularly things like Divorce Song and, and Fuck and Run that still really move me. Um, it, one of my, you know, there's a film I love called Lawrence of Arabia. I don't know. Have you ever seen that, that film, sure. Daryl? Of course. <laughs> so the interesting thing about Lawrence of Arabia, which I've now probably seen 25 times, is it's a different film for me every time I go back to it because I'm a slightly different person. And so I experience it as a work of art differently. And that's that is the relationship I have to Exile and Guyville. It when I listen to it, it instantly takes me back to what it was like to be a young person in 1993. Um, but I also see the songs differently now as an adult, uh, as somebody who's who's a lot older. And so uh, when I was trying to write songs that responded to what she had done, uh, it's from a pretty different perspective than the perspective I would have had when I first bought the record years ago. Sure. So, but you said you kind of had this idea floating around for a while. Did you have um, some, you know, ideas that had been floating around as long as you'd been thinking about it in terms of, uh, you know, uh, chords or riffs or pieces of the song that were already, you know, in the ether that that you could grab onto? Or did you just start from scratch? I mean... I think it would be fair to say that for 15 or 20 years, I had a burning desire to rip off the Divorce Song because I just really love it. Uh -huh. uh, it's a very, uh, it's kind of a sneaky chord progression, but it has a pretty basic rhythm. Uh, so I, I think that's probably where I started uh, on on this project. And so uh, Divorce Song is is basically a song that, it's a breakup song that that she wrote. Uh, from from her perspective, and I thought it would be fun to mirror image the song. So the song that I wrote is from the perspective of the guy who's who's about to get broken up with, whether he he knows it or not. Mm -hmm. um, once once I had written the first one, I I kind of saw a way into the record that I hadn't thought about before. Mm -hmm. So I I started to try to just get as close as possible to each of the songs and I saw in Guyville. And I was either writing songs from the perspective of uh, the, the guys who are featured in her songs, or I was trying to, to pick up on kind of the emotional core of what the song meant to me and, and, and turn that around. And because I had a lot of free time during the pandemic, <laughs> Because sure. I, you know, couldn't leave my house. You know, I was just there with a bunch of guitars. In a way, I, I had not sat still that long in more than a decade. I just, I had a lot of time uh, to spend with this project before we actually got released from pandemic prison and could go into a studio together. Right, but I'm also guessing that uh, it had been a long time since you had written. Uh, a lot of songs in a row with the intention of releasing them. So was there a lot of um, rust to scrape off in that regard as a songwriter? So I think that, uh, I think that songwriters, a lot of them probably have this in common, which is there's a spigot that gets turned on and, and turned off. It can be hard if it's gotten turned off to turn it back on again. Mm -hmm. uh, but once I started writing and once it kind of became clear to me that we were actually going to make another record, then yeah, like literally like dozens of songs uh, poured out of me over like about a, a year's amount of time. And I, you know, I want to be clear. Um, I, I didn't write all the music on the record. So the other unusual thing about this record is that 
you know, I I played in a band with my brother uh, that was based in San Francisco, toured all over the country and played big shows, but we were the only kind of permanent members of the band, Daryl. There were different phases of the band, though, where we played with a bunch of different people. And so what was unique about making this record was uh, that all of these different great musicians who had played in the band but hadn't necessarily played with each other were all participating and trading song ideas. Um, and so there were, you know, there were a lot of songs on the record that started with a piece of music that somebody else sent me. Right. Then, you know, I, I could just work with that. It seems like in that regard, there's a lot of cat herding that would have to go on to 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 turn some of these things into, you know, songs and, and finished products where everybody can kind of, you know, weigh in or have their say or or whatever. Was it a as opposed to you know when it's just you and your brother or you and your brother and the other two guys as opposed to, you know, now you're talking about six, seven, eight guys. Um, was that a kind of a weird navigation negotiation or did it all kind of work out easier than you anticipated it would have been impossible a couple of decades ago um mm. when when we were doing it you're older and mellower now <laughs> well we were all on really uh good behavior uh okay. this this time around so the um you know by the end we had so many different songs demoed in different forms that what we essentially did was just uh the guy in the, the band who's good at math created a very complicated straw poll system that you know we ended up using to select the the tracks that ended up on the on the record but you know everybody was fine with that because Part of what was great about this project was just getting to make music again uh, with some of my old friends. For sure. Yeah, I can totally see that, that it's, uh, you know, you're and also you're kind of released from all the, you know, you don't have, you know, you don't have a big label uh, looking over your shoulder. You don't have somebody going, oh, you know, I don't know, is there a single here? I mean, you you were just able to 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 do it for the love of wanting to do it as opposed to necessarily having expectations and obligations and all those other things that come along with being you know in the position you were in 20 years ago yeah i mean being released from all commercial considerations actually makes it much easier to make a record yeah totally i can totally see that i mean uh, you know um even so this seems to me like a project that even with something you've been thinking about wanting to do for decades and you have all the people it 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 really strikes me as something where it sounds great initially, and then when you're on like song eight of eighteen, you're going, "Oh God, when what did what did I sign up for?" You know. Um, you know, it never felt like that. Mm -hmm. uh, the the songs kind of just came, like the songs came in a rush. Now, I I should say that I was toying with this idea of doing uh, what we you know, started to refer to as like our exile on Jane Street project <laughs> about halfway through the writing process. There was a lot of other material. We probably demoed 50 different songs. Wow. Uh, and it just, it, it happened that the material that everybody was the most excited about uh, were kind of all these exile and Guyville songs uh, that I had written. And so that that's ultimately where the, the the focus ended up being, and um, you know, we theoretically have a you know another couple of records worth of new material. But I guess we'll get to at some point. Great, uh, and so the next one I presume will be titled "Gluttons for Punishment." Yeah, something, <laughs> something like that. Uh, so, so recording this, I mean, you guys kind of did this uh, old school, right? I mean, you you all ended up in in a studio at the same time in the same place, right? Yeah, we, uh, you know, so I. Uh, the years kind of all bleed together now, uh, but as soon as there were vaccines and people could travel, uh, we booked time uh, at a recording studio in Austin called 512 Studios, uh, and we went in, I, I think, for five or six days uh, and did most of the basics, cut most of the drums and, mm -hmm. and bass, and then we was, did... Was everybody there? Yeah, everybody came. Wow, okay, that, because uh, again, cat herding, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a really uh eight you know because you guys have like what five guitar players or something i mean it's it's out of control 
yeah it's a uh you know we were joking about that because we played a show in houston the other day where everybody uh came and played daryl and uh, we had four guitar players on stage which takes southern rock to a, a yeah. whole a whole new totally unwieldy level yeah you're gonna have to learn freebird <laughs> thankfully it's only three chords yeah well exactly um, so, so, uh, you know, I'm guessing even, even, uh, doing it the old school way, old school is, is a lot different from the last time you guys were in a studio together, probably. Right. You know, uh, when I started making records, everybody, including us was still recording on two inch tape. Mm -hmm. And by the, by the end, pro, you know, everybody was using pro tools, uh, mm -hmm. but you know, the difference between 2002 and now is that recording technology wasn't so great that you could literally like, you know, set up a studio in your house, right? You know, mix or, or overdub. So, uh, and you weren't able to trade sessions. That would be the other thing that would have been impossible in 2002 is, uh, there would have been a hard drive, you know, in a studio somewhere, but you weren't, you wouldn't have had the ability that we have now to have, People go back to Minneapolis and Los Angeles and Seattle and San Francisco and just start overdubbing parts. All right. And so you, that's that's what ended up happening. You kind of did the beds in the studio and then everybody could kind of chip in and chip away at it. Yeah. OK. And uh, so how did, how did, I mean, was that just because I can see it turning into kind of an unwieldy free for all unless there's some kind of plan of doing, uh, you know, how did you approach that aspect of it? Um, you know, typically what we were doing was um, everybody would just take a shot at, particularly with the guitar tracks or with the, the hook sterile, people would take a shot at overdubs and we'd kind of pick a direction out. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, whoever had come up with the part would go back and do it again. Now, mm -hmm. you know, that's not to say the songs were ridiculously overtracked by the time they got mixed. Mm -hmm. So uh, mixing, uh was as much about what we weren't using as as what we ended up using right yeah no no they don't sound uh like they've you know got 300 guitars on them or anything they all they're all discernible um uh so you know living all over the place like that it's 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 kind of wild that you were able to you know, still make those connections. Um, did did you, you know, the in terms of getting the relationships back together, did that just like, was that like getting back on the bike kind of thing? Yeah, it's exactly like getting back on the bike. The funny thing is that, uh, you know, it's it feels as if no time pa has passed, even yeah. if it's been, you know, a decade. You're just, you're, uh, it's like with siblings. You're instantly kind of back in the same room uh, with the same relationships uh, that that you had, and, and you know, these are all folks that I toured with, so we spent a lot of time in bands and backstage with each other over the years. And so, uh, so when it came to the, the 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 songs, I mean, do you have are, are you the guy with final say, or is it kind of a democracy, or or how how's it working? Um. You know, Bruce Springsteen, you know, has famously said that bands can't be democracies. And right. I, I, I think that's probably right. And certainly uh, Vegas to Milo was not a democracy uh, back in the day when we were on a, a record label and making records. Uh, that was really not how I wanted to approach things mm -hmm. uh, this, this time around. So this was a much more collective effort. Uh, and really, you know, a much more fun record to make than anything we had done in the past. Oh, definitely. And and I think, you know, we should probably point out that people don't need to be Liz Fair fans uh, to, to, to enjoy it. Like, it's not so um, tied in that, you know, you have to have Exile in Guyville to get this. You can just listen to this on its own. Yeah, look, if, if Liz Fair heard this, I think she might not see any connection at all. <laughs> uh, between Black Sheep Lodge and Exile and, and, and Guy Bell. It's certainly, uh, there were a few songs where I intentionally tried to cop the musical feel right. of, of, of some of uh, what she was doing. But if you if you ask the other guys in the band, I think they'd probably tell you that this is our replacements record. 
Mm. Yeah, there's um, definitely some. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you start off with Charlie Watts, which to me not only has obviously a Stonesy feel, but it's kind of the same Stonesy feel she's using on on six foot one. So you can right. kind of hear the. Yeah. But then there are, are songs to me. I mean, Tuesday Night Fever to me is is a hold steady song. Um, you know, uh, I, what New York Girls to me has, has some of the Wilco's uh, yep. California stars in it. Yep. Um, you know, so there's a there's a real wide variety of stuff. It definitely is not um, stuck in the '90s or stuck in the Rolling Stones. And and as you said, there's a lot of yeah, there's a lot of replacements in there. Just a lot of that scrappy uh, indie rock sound. Um, is that still what you kind of gravitate to as a listener? I, I would say that it's the band that everybody who's currently in Vegas to Milo can agree upon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, you know, if, Very you, diplomatic. <laughs> if you were to ask everybody, name, mm -hmm. name the three best rock bands ever. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure the replacements would be in the top three among everybody that I'm, that I'm playing with. They're certainly in mind. Right. For sure. Um, did you, did you get that Tim uh, reissue that they put out last oh, year? Oh yeah. Isn't that great? Isn't that, I mean, the, the remix where you can hear, uh, you can finally hear Bob's guitars. To me, that was just a revelation, you know? Um, yeah, I read, uh, there's a great oral history of them called Trouble Boys, Daryl, yeah. that came out book, years yeah. ago, you know, that I bought and read, you know, the week it came out. It's kind of a, it's really, it's a pretty heartbreaking story of sure. the, the band. They were very, very determined to fail and uh achieve that spe spectacularly um but tim is just a masterpiece and uh, the new mix that ed Stasem did is just incredible yeah isn't it so reading trouble boys did you did you uh have a little bit of deja vu of i mean not that you guys were uh, as spectacularly self-destructive as the replacements were but i think some of that you know some of any rock band story has some universal tales of of the road and bad gigs and idiot promoters and this and that and the other thing. Um, there's a reason that every behind the music episode is essentially the same. Yeah, exactly. It's, you know, every rock band, you know, essentially goes through the the same cycle. I mean, you know, everybody starts playing on a Tuesday night to three bands and a bartender. Yep. And do you just you hope to take it someplace from there? Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, to that end, the speaking of gluttons for punishment, uh, are you guys actually? Well, you said you've you've been playing. You just played a, a hometown show. You're gonna are you gonna venture farther and wider with this? So our our touring plan for 2024 is that we're basically gonna play a show in everybody's hometown. So okay, that makes we're sense. not we're not getting in a van again. Uh, but we're going to play in Seattle. And in fact, I think, you know, there's a listening party for the record that's going to be uh, in Seattle on March the, the 30th. Um, we're going to play San Francisco and L.A. We're going to go play Minneapolis, uh, hometown of the replacements. Yeah. So that's our plan for 2024. And then we'll we'll see about the summer of 2025. if We don't actually get in the van again. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Have you uh do, do you have kids? I do not. Oh, okay. I was because I was gonna ask if you know uh, if your wife and kids are uh, you know if this would be like a an introduction to a, a past version of yourself for, for some people. Um I think it's more like a like a horrifying acid flashback to my wife. <laughs> well, I mean, because I'm guessing you know you went a, a long time without without getting on a stage, right? Yeah. Um, what was what was that like? Was it again the the, the bicycle analogy? Uh, the first time you got up again? Um, it's super fun to play live. Yep. And you know we we were playing for friends and a lot of friends and family in in Houston the other night. Uh, that's easy to do. Because 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 I would think that could be more intimidating than playing for a, a room full of strangers. Um. You know we we when we played the other night, it's everybody was just there to. To have a fun time so you know the right. strange thing about being like a professional uh musician when you play is that the cities that are most famous for music in some ways are the least fun places to play right uh like it's <laughs> without disparaging anybody's hometown you know what i found is the further that we got away from big cities uh right. 
the more fun the shows tended to be because people were just there to have a to have a good time it's, yeah well i mean i, I think uh, uh you know a guy in a band uh, i used to know is you know once famously quipped that uh um south by southwest is basically where music dreams go to die you know which i thought was a, a pretty apt characterization of it you know um so are you more um are you nervous about this album coming out or is it just all all good you it's, know yeah it's all good at this point because my uh my livelihood is not tied up on on whether we sign to a major i don't need to have a hit single yeah. uh this was just an exercise to make you know the the best record that we possibly could uh reconnect with a bunch of my old friends and get the record out, out into the world uh, you know it's uh it's it's been an amazing run so far uh no fist fights nothing's been broken everybody's getting along so uh, is that a surprise were you were you anticipating uh, uh some old resentments to pop up maybe well daryl uh, you seem like you're pretty familiar with your rock and roll history so you know that uh brothers and rock and roll bands tend to not always be on the best of terms uh -huh. uh, but as you can see i don't have any black eyes so i've got all all my teeth so mm -hmm. my brother and i managed to not kill each other all right well yeah you so you're not you're not uh, uh noel and liam uh, nobody's nobody's smashed a guitar over anybody else's head yet no not yet but i'm so disappointed with noel and liam uh that they won't get back together so i i i'm have threatened noel that if they don't get back together and make a new record that biggest a mile is going to have to do it for them so well there I, you go the, yeah. the gauntlet is thrown yeah, down the gauntlet's down <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, they could get in line behind uh, Dave and Phil Elvin and uh, Ray and Dave Davies and uh, God, everybody else in the world. Um, and then and then you say that you've got enough now for for another album. Are you already uh, thinking ahead to that or are you still just uh, enjoying the moment of this? So I think I think what's supposed to happen, like in pretty short order, is that uh, because of the limitations of, of vinyl you know we didn't put all 18 songs of the exile and jane record on on black sheep lodge there just wasn't enough space so the the songs that are left over i think we're going to issue as as an ep pretty shortly hmm. uh and then you know like a lot of bands um we probably recorded three times as much material as we ever released and mm. so I, I think this year we're going to start to see um, several archival re releases of, of material that hadn't previously come out. Well, nice. It's like it's like uh, you're back. Yeah, it's great. I'm back. All right. Well, cool. Well, listen, that's all I got for you. So uh, I will let you get on with the rest of your day. But uh, thanks for your time and and thanks for this album. Definitely one of the most interesting, you know, intriguing kind of approaches I've seen on something lately. And uh, and and you know even more so it's not um the concept doesn't get in the way like it works you know what i mean like because you could easily imagine that the uh the concept of the album would kind of be so heavy that it would you know oh this song doesn't work or that song doesn't work and you've shoehorned things into blah 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 but but again it just it just stands on its own and works as 12 good rock and roll songs so bonus points for that you know hey i really i really appreciate it daryl and uh, i appreciate the chance to get to talk to you about the record today all right well listen uh maybe sometime you'll come up to canada and uh if so we'll see you there that would be great i would love that we can we can talk about those two fellows behind you oh exactly there's plenty to say all right my friend we'll listen thanks again take care and we'll see you somewhere down the road thanks daryl bye bye-bye